Good morning, everyone. Good morning, church. Um, so, um, as we gather for communion today, um, I'd like us all to sort of consider what the promise, what a promise is worth to you these days. The standard definition goes along the lines of a declaration or assurance that something uh, will happen or someone will do something. Promises are a fundamental element in human relationships. Uh, they signify many things, including trust, commitment, accountability, and yet human promises are most often frail, prone to falter under the weight of our own circumstances or out of human frailty. I'm sure we've all experienced the sting of broken promises in the past, whether it is on a personal level or in the wider world. Um, whilst I was sort of searching for examples, um, I remembered studying um, a particular Shakespearean play back in high school. It's called Julius Caesar. Uh, anyone remember that? Yeah. Um, where in ancient Rome, uh, upon the Ides of March, Julius Caesar was betrayed by one of his closest allies, Brutus, who was among the conspirators in his assassination. Now Caesar had trusted Brutus, even to the point of referring to him as a son. But Brutus ultimately broke his promise of loyalty and participated in Caesar's murder. He even ended up delivering the fatal blow. And broken promises can also be found in the workplace. For example, when someone uses my room and promises to leave things the way they found them. Mm. Or, and yes, you know where I'm going with this. Um, I'm going there again. When there is this promise um, that is made that the toilet is definitely fixed this time. Mm. Yeah, okay. And looking back to a couple of weeks ago, um, I briefly mentioned the topic of national reconciliation. Um, another example where throughout history, um, indigenous peoples across the world have faced broken promises from governments where treaties made to guarantee land rights, autonomy, and protection, often going unfulfilled, lead to mass displacement, loss of cultural identity, and the ongoing struggle for recognition. And um, rather more closer to home, um, broken marriage promises can result in profound emotional pain, shattered trust, resentment, and communication breakdown, and even sadly leading to the dissolution of the relationship. But even in a world where promises can become fragile and easily shattered, um, as followers of Christ, we are given the opportunity to find solace in the unbreakable promise that we have with our Creator. Right at the beginning of the Old Testament in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, we see that God promises Abraham that he would bless him and make him into a great nation, and that all peoples on earth would be blessed through him. And despite Abraham and Sarah's old age and barrenness, God fulfilled his promise by giving them a son, Isaac, and eventually establishing the nation of Israel in the promised land. Then in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 34, where there is the promise of a new covenant where God will put his law in the minds and write it on the hearts of his people, forgiving their sins and remembering them no more. God fulfilled his promise through the coming of Jesus Christ, establishing a new covenant, one based on grace and forgiveness and the gift of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of the believers. Fulfillment of this promise is succinctly outlined in John 3.16 to 17, where we find one of the most well-known and widely quoted Bible verses even sometimes being referred to as the gospel in a nutshell. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him 
shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And finally, in Revelation 21, verses 3 to 4, we see the promise of a new heaven and a new earth, where God will dwell with his people, wiping every tear from their eyes and removing death, mourning, crying, and pain. And so, unlike human promises, God's covenant with us is unyielding and everlasting. God has consistently demonstrated his faithfulness, not only throughout the Bible, but I'm sure that each of us, as brothers and sisters in Christ, have seen him faithfully at work in each of our lives. Communion serves as a powerful reminder of our covenant with God. The pinnacle of this covenant is achieved through Jesus Christ as the perfect sacrifice which sealed the covenant with his blood on the cross. As we take the bread and wine, we are reaffirming our commitment to this covenant established through Christ Jesus. And through communion, we are renewed in our faith and strengthened to live out our lives according to God's plan. As we remove the bread and take it in our own time today, let us remember that Christ's body was broken for each of us and his blood was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. We thank you for the gift of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, and that through his sacrifice and resurrection, we find hope and the promise of eternal life. May we continue to remember the depth of your love and the extent of your grace, and may our lives be a testament to your faithfulness and a reflection of your glory. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. And as we pray over the offering, God our Father, bless these tithes and offerings that we bring to you today and use these to accomplish your will throughout this church. Grant wisdom to those who will handle these gifts so that they may make wise use of them in spreading the good news of the gospel to further your kingdom. And bless the works of our hands in this ministry at MCCOC. We pray all these things in the name of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Great to see you all here today. For those of you who don't know me, I can see a couple of people I might not have met. My name is Naaman. I'd love to talk to you after the service. Um, yeah, I just want to bring you a couple of quick updates this morning and we'll continue on with uh, our focus, uh, spiritual focus for the rest of the service. Um, a really important one is that throughout the munch month of March, which we are currently in, every Sunday morning you have the invitation to gather at 8.30 in the morning and then go on a prayer walk around the Glen Waverley Activity Centre, right in the heart of the community where we are right now. And as we go on that walk, we're going to stop at seven different locations and stop and pray as a group. 
and there are prompts to follow there as well. There was an email sent out about all of this, which is great, but otherwise, even if you didn't get that, just come along at 8.30 in the morning and join the group. Alternatively, if you can't make it or perhaps mobility is a bit of an issue for you, grab some of the information at the back later on because you can still be praying through um, and visualising those different points in our community and participate um, in that really important um, exercise. So strongly encourage you to get involved with that one. Uh, does anybody here have, have a youth in their family? Somebody who's a teenager? Yeah, okay, a few heads nodding. Does anybody know a teenager? Has anybody heard of a teenager? Yeah, good. Okay, if you fall into any of those categories, I really want to encourage you to be praying for the youth of our church and the lead up to this event on the 22nd of March called Youth Fest. Um, a number of churches from around the community are gathering together um, to host an event where youth can gather, um, participate in fun activities, food, games, all that kind of thing, but then really be intentional about praise and worship and hearing um, and the message of Jesus. So that's coming up on the 22nd of March. If you know anybody that you think could be invited, um, a son or daughter, um, a grandchild, a niece or a nephew, or even a neighbour or something like that, um, think about how you might be able to invite them. And for more information, talk to Johnny or Amanda, um, our youth leaders who are out there with the youth just at the moment. And finally, many of you are aware of Bible Study Fellowship and have heard of that. Every week, um, we host the young adults from Bible Study Fellowship, BSF, here in our building. And occasionally, they open it up to everybody to come along for a variety of seminars and information. And so, um, we have an opportunity to participate in that on Monday the 18th of March too. If you would like to know about leading a small group, you're invited to come along to that seminar. You don't have to be a young adult yourself anymore. You might consider yourself a more senior or mature adult. Um, still welcome to come along to that and um, participate as well. Jenny, you're going to come and read us the Bible this morning. Thank you. And then we'll hand over to Peter, um, who's going to bring us the first message in our uh, lead up to Easter. Our reading this morning is from Mark chapter 11, verses 1 to 10. Jesus comes to Jerusalem as king. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples to them. Go to the, to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it and will send it back shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clo uh, cloaks, cloth over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Good morning, all. Uh, you did read the last verse as well, didn't you? Sorry. That might have been the technology. I thought uh, Jenny's very up-to-date with the iPhone, all that type of thing. That's really good. This is, this is my iPhone. 
I've got little sketches in it to remind me what I'm going to say next and all that type of thing. But uh, yeah, that verse 11 will be crucial as we come to a point of closure uh, in the message time this morning. Now, as, uh, as I look around, and Naaman did, uh, and uh, tried to identify people that maybe I'd not seen before, but uh, welcome everyone. My name's Peter, and I was looking for the Doss family, but they're not here this morning. Oh, why, why are you sitting in the back? Anyway, I needed to pause for a moment and congratulate. What are they called? The Limbrook Lagers? Under 12 runners up. I went and watched the game. They got within five runs. Yeah, it ran out of overs. But well done, Jaron and coach. Well done. And, and the other little congratulation is to the ladies yesterday. I rolled up to pick up Margie for the, for the ladies event. No, no, the the creative way they used the hottest part of yesterday, I couldn't believe. Well done, ladies, and all that creative energy that you uh, sort of overcame the heat energy with. But it's good to know that as a community of faith, there are a variety of ways that we're engaging in life. And so I did want to highlight those because we are often encouraging each other to move into the community. We're encouraging each other to fellowship. Those two need to go together for the purpose of, as it were, extending the testimony of the grace of God that we celebrate so regularly on a Sunday morning. I'd like to pray and then we will turn our focus uh, to that Mark uh, account of Jesus entering Jerusalem as king. Thank you, Lord, that we are a people who can celebrate who you are. We can be gathered and be assured because you have made those multiple promises and that you are good for your word. It won't diminish in any sense. Your faithfulness is eternal. And we're looking in this time, Father, to establish, allow ourselves to be established by your Spirit even more deeply into your faithfulness, that we become a people who are, as it were, know that confidence of your Spirit within us as we fellowship together and as we move in a testimony, in carrying a witness, as it were, to the end of the ages, to the ends of the earth wherever that might be geographically. So thank you, Lord, that we can gather, we can celebrate, we can urge, we can encourage, we can receive, we can respond. All of these things that you fit into this space and you work in the lives of each one of us. And I bless you and thank you, Father, for your active faithfulness in our presence. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, there's a fair possibility that uh, a number of people in this space have uh, uh, engaged this portion of God's Word before, most likely under the title, The Triumphal Entry. One of those key events that come into this season that we, we call Easter, uh, and, and it's, it's one of those early events, even though it's not all that far from the actual occasion of the death and resurrection of Jesus. We're spreading it over a month or so, but a lot of this stuff's confined into a short space of time. And it's here in this, in this season of Lent, these uh, 40 days or so. I do, I do, I do ask, uh, people here participate in Lent? I've discovered a variety of people do. It's, it's a wonderful opportunity uh, and I'm engaging it in a different angle this year, and I find, well, that's, that's really valuable because I'm very, very conscious of the time measure and, and the things that I'm doing and the things that I'm able to put aside and pick up something else for the purpose of appreciating uh, those, those spaces that are provided to um, better approach uh, the, this, these central events uh, of the death and resurrection, death, burial and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, and, and we do well. We're, we're people uh, that can be very active, we can be very busy, we can be engaged in a whole lot of things. But this time of discipline allows us to sort of say, I, I want to very, very consciously uh, make available time, energy, focus and all those type of things to, to again appreciate uh, this, this amazing event. And I'm anticipating it'll be easier in that sort of generic term of easier for people who have been a part of our celebrations over the last month and a bit as we've sat under that simple question, what on earth is salvation? 
Now, we're not going to have an exam, we're not going to have a test, we're not going to have a recall session or anything like that. But I'm anticipating that as we've sat under the ministry in a variety of ways over the last month, that that question has now got an extra level of stirring as we come into this season. Because we do know that this whole salvation thing, that term that has theological explanations and definitions that vary so much in many ways academically, but at the very centre of it is the identity of Jesus. And we can't move away from that as much as we like to gather a few more words. So this morning I want to come to this approach to Mark's account of the triumphal entry. And I want to put it into this framework, into four segments. I want to look at the context, the timing, the dynamics, and the significance. Now, with the context, particularly, uh, we, we're privileged people. We can uh, have a look at this passage before the Sunday. Most of us are aware of what the passage is going to be. We can look at it and we we'll sort of say, what's the context? So I read before and I read after. It's a very, very simple exercise, no, no great demand there. But I look at what's, what's actually happening uh, in this space uh, and, and we can appreciate the context and then we can appreciate, hopefully, the content of what we're actually focused on at any given point of time. We do it in life. Every time we stop and pause, I can consciously say, what has been happening, what has happened and what am I looking forward to? the types of things that we don't necessarily consciously do, but we're actually doing them. In this script, Jesus and his disciples are on the way to Jerusalem. And that city is a key place of reference for Jesus. It's uh, the centre of God activity over the generations, centuries, and will continue to be so. So this has uh, been a long time centre of focus for, for big plan God events. And Jesus is clear on his mandate. He is on about getting people to meet God. He is on about people get, to getting to meet his father. That's the punchline that, that ultimately gets people offside. How can, how can this human identity speak of having a relationship as of the son of a father? And so it is his mandate that he wants to and is setting out to that uh, make provision for people to meet God. Provision for people across the nations. Whatever geographical location, whatever nationality, ethnic group, social group, cultural group, or whatever context they might be in, even downtown Glen Waverley, sitting in a chapel called Monash City Church of Christ. I did have to, I did have, to have a little chuckle when uh, Anthony was praying and he prayed that the Lord would understand what's happening at MCCOC. And I thought, I wonder if the Lord knows what that means. You know, these, these letter abbreviations that we do. I'm, I'm sure he's right across it, Anthony. No worries. I was just one of those things that I occasionally get distracted by. But the Lord has, has in, in, uh, in plan, clearly as his life mandate, to complete a work that will make it possible for people to meet God, to meet the Father. And so this opening uh, comment of Mark 11, it says... The, the, the disciples made their, Jesus made their approach to, to Jerusalem. And we could actually sort of read that as saying, well, this is, you know, that's just Jesus on about his daily routine and he's setting off to Jerusalem. But it's been a long term, a long way out that Jesus said, I'm heading to Jerusalem. His approach, his run up, as it were, is quite a long one. We cross over to Luke's gospel and we read this. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. He's not going to be distracted. Now, that's a fair way back in his ministry. But then, some of you might remember Christmas last year. Remember Christmas last year? 23? We haven't had the 24 one yet. But we used this narrative from Luke chapter 2. And I'm going to stretch a little bit. 
of my comprehension of Jesus. The narrative in Luke 2 read like this. Simon, who's this older gentleman in the temple, uh, Jesus is being presented. He's a month old. He's being dedicated to the Lord. Simon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, that's a good connect with what Anthony was sharing, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all the nations, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Now that's the bit on the screen. I'm going to read the bit that's not on the screen. Listen closely. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simon blessed him and said to Mary his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul. I'm speculating that that little boy of a month received that prophetic word. I'll let the theologians deal with how far back Jesus knew exactly what he was going to do. But when a prophet speaks a word into a person's life, no matter what their age, the Spirit of God quickens it as the days go on. So that's the broader context. For those who want to see a little bit of the immediate context, again, as I mentioned before, it's simple. You turn back to the chapter previous. And we find in that chapter, Mark, whose account, his account, the gospel account as such, is is quite brief. doesn't go open up a lot of the topics that the other gospel writers do. But in that chapter prior, there is mention of marriage. Children are welcome in the kingdom, rich in the kingdom. The mention of his imminent death, Jesus does that for the third time. Uh, James and John having a discussion about the seating arrangements when this kingdom arrives and the testimony of blind Bartimaeus. Now, I mention all that not to open up what it all means, but simply think, uh, simply to, to acknowledge that there's a whole stack of stuff going on around the life of Jesus. He's instigating so much. He's leading into people's lives. There is so much that's happening on a, on a narrative basis, on a conversation basis, on a healing basis. And this is just the whole building up. Now, if you and I, we ask the simple question, if you and I are in that space, not just the space of the 12 disciples of Jesus, but if I'm in the space of those crowds of people that would readily, quickly, rapidly, as soon as they knew where Jesus was, they'd be there. And so they're seeing all this stuff happen. They're hearing these conversations. They're seeing miracles take place. They're being challenged by thought patterns that they've held for generations and, and they're going around and there's a whole lot of them got their heads spinning. That's the context. And already I've moved on to the timing. We're sometimes conscious of timing on a Sunday morning. But in brief, the timing of these, uh, this, this event of Jesus entering in Jerusalem is perfect. It's down to the minute. It's down to the second when you look at the narrative of the way that these disciples sent out to fetch the cult, for example. How timely that was. It's it's an amazing narrative to look at. But we know that with Jesus, every step he took was on time. The places he went, the people he met, the conversations he he entered into, the forums he engaged, the particular actions he took were all intentional, purposeful and all perfectly timed. And we know that this particular occasion is perfectly timed as well. It's not because it's the beginning of Lent. It's because it's the Passover. This massive event that drew together people from all... They were moving everywhere. You you talk about traffic conditions in Glen Waverley, nothing like Jerusalem 
and the time of the Passover. People go in every direction. For anybody who's ever been to Jerusalem, when people start moving every direction in Jerusalem and there's hordes of people coming from outside the city because they want to be a part of this special celebration in the city of God. Those alleyways are chockers with people. And so we discover that this, this timing of what Jesus is doing is, is perfect. It's a, the perfect time to make a statement. To make a statement that people will take notice of. Now, how do you do that? How do you do that? If you're a person who knows that the moment you go out into the street, people are going to gather around you. They've all got their sets of expectations. They, they've all got these things that they know that Jesus is going to do or whatever it is. They're very keen to get close to this person, Jesus, because amazing things happen when you do that. So how is he going to make a statement? Well, you and I know, and particularly those who love the King James Version, any time that Jesus really wanted to make a statement, so to speak, he would get the people to sort of come reasonably close, and then he'd say, verily, verily. Anybody heard that before? But you haven't heard it for a while. He would get there, when people heard that, that there would be a hush because they had this anticipation that when Jesus spoke, there was something significant. When he made a statement, it struck. Well, not on this occasion. So we look at the dynamics. What happened? Jesus got this crowd forming around him and he presents, as it were, Act 1 of Julius Caesar. Where did I hear that recently? He portrays his statement. He, he makes a statement simply by his manner, his gesture, his position, and his simply moving into the city. Not a word spoken. Now here's the question bit. For the scholars, BSF students, what's the significance of the cult, the donkey? What's the punchline out of that that Jesus is making? I, 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 I shouldn't put people in this position because people do it to me all the time. It's good when you're on Zoom. Is it? You notice that when you're using Zoom? Because you can punch video and you disappear off the screen and nobody can see you. It's like as if you're not even in the meeting. But the punchline is this humility. It's, it's, it, it couldn't have been more powerfully stated. There's simply to identify that one of those key relational characteristics of Jesus is his humility. And of course, when, when I read that, and for the scholars who would like to, you know that that was actually a prophetic act. Zechariah 9.9 9 says exactly that. Spoke of this king entering the city on a donkey. But on this particular occasion, there's a silence that comes and draws, as it were, the recognition. The recognition of Jesus in the context of humility. As I'm reading that prophetic verse and I'm thinking that donkey and all those types of things, um, I start to connect other little bits and pieces of the New Testament in a personal journey. You don't have to do this. This is not, this is not a scholarly exercise. This is just a personal faith exercise. Because when I consider the donkey, there is this humility and there is also this realisation it's a simple uh, animal of transport of burden, carrying a burden. And so what comes to my mind is Matthew 11, 28, 30. Come to me, all of you who labour, heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle, humble, lowly in heart. You'll find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I just love that passage because it comes at me from a whole variety of directions every time I read it. And then for some reason, my theological mind kicks in as well. Philippians 2, the Apostle Paul writes this. Because Jesus doesn't just want people to see his humility. 
He wants them to embrace it. I want you to follow me and yes, you're going to listen to my teaching, but watch my actions. There was the miraculous. There was the profound things that he said. No doubt about it. But you look to his very core of his identity. You see, as the Apostle Paul says this, have this mind amongst yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself. He became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name that is above every other name. Heard that statement before today? Hopefully when we're declaring those things in song, there's a testimony in the Spirit that says, that's something I don't only believe that, I own that. And what I, what I embrace, the Holy Spirit says, they're my instruments of reshaping your life to make you Christ-like. Such humility. And it's amazing that the gesture draws the response of people. Initially, it's the two disciples put a blanket, as it were, their cloak over the back of the, the colt, the, the donkey. Is that for hygiene reasons? That's a, well, apparently, it's a form of respect. It's a form of honouring. It's a form of recognising something about this person that draws out of my life a response that says, I'm acknowledging this person even though I'm not fully comprehending. And then, of course, you know the second part of the, of the triumphal, triumphal entry. So we have the donkey. What was the other part? Palm branches. Anybody, anybody bring one this morning? It's quite an amazing narrative. I look at it and sort of say, where did all those branches come from? I mean, not a lot of people walk around with a palm branch tucked in their pocket. And the narrative, is, as earthy as it is, demonstrates how these people actually strip the trees around. I said, gee, I hope it was their property and not somebody else's. Would you like somebody coming into your place and say, oh, that's a lovely palm tree. I'll take that. Anyway, the picture being that these people are so stirred, as it were, within as to their recognition of something about Jesus, something about this kingly quality in Jesus. There's something about this person that's suggesting, I will celebrate the victory that he's... Well, he hasn't won it yet. But amazingly, they're already portraying, as they would often do if there, if there was a, a battle being won in war in that, in that region and, and, and it had been won, the forces would return home and all the locals would come out with their palm branches and celebrate the victory. Victory hasn't been won yet. And yet this response is being drawn. It's an amazing picture and the simplicity uh, of the way in which Mark presents it is one that is, um, sometimes it's so simple, we, we don't embrace the profoundness of what's going on. Now the next bit we are familiar with because the people start shouting, they start singing, Hosanna. Okay, another question. I might even get a response this time. We sing Hosanna. What does Hosanna mean? You need to speak up because I've got my headphones on. Basically, it means save us. Save us now. What an amazing call for these people to make. But we do know that as they declared that, as they got, as it were, the crowd dynamic got louder and louder, the voices got louder. They weren't necessarily singing, led by Amanda. Thanks, Amanda, for your leading, but... No sign of any Amanda in that group. These were all crying out this, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us now, save us now, and all the other narrative that comes along. And they're doing that as, as it were, of something spontaneous within them. Do they realise, do they realise that who they are crying to is the one who can do it? His very name means he saves Jesus, he saves. They're heading in the right direction. 
But the difficulty was their agenda underneath. And for those who've done that little bit of research through BCF, BSF, BCF, sorry, wrong company, BSF, I'm not going fishing just yet, as much fun as it might be. BSF would have that understanding that underneath this urgency, this, this recognition, this heralding king, this, this seeing a victory, a potential victory, and getting all excited about being delivered, as it were, they're all thinking personal, political, comfortable, my identity, my people, my space. They got the terminology right. But sadly their comprehension of the terminology was lacking. It is, it is amazing what's happening in this place. And the other amazing thing, as you read Mark's account, how quickly it goes from, we anticipate thousands of people have been drawn into this procession that initially started with a dozen or so, is now thousands. All of this Chorusing going on and palm branches going on. It's not, it's not an organised march. There's a certain element of chaos about it. And it seems like it just goes... Whew, and all the lights go out. You read the narrative. Where is she? You were listening to, to, to Jenny. You know, that it's, it seems like just... The MCG goes dark. People go home. All of a sudden the, the fever pitch has diminished. Suddenly people start thinking of dinner. It's getting dark. Whatever it is, the crowd disperses. They go home, possibly, to think about what they were just drawn into. How Astounding it is that this man, sitting on a donkey, walking down the street, has drawn out the agendas, the heart agendas of thousands of people without saying a word. So these people are dispersing. Jesus has one more thing to do before his day is finished, the narrative says. This is the verse 11. He heads off to the temple. Heads off to the temple, have a quick check what's going on. He knew exactly what was going on in the temple. It was the tail end of the day. It was getting quiet. There's just a few people tidying up, as it were. And he looks at the place and he says, I'll be back tomorrow. You can read the next chapter to find out what happens tomorrow. But I need to finish with the significance. The significance of this particular event See how these hearts of people, the heart desires of people were drawn out by this gesture of Jesus. And have a listen to what they were declaring. You can look for yourself. Just look at the terminology. It's all terminology that we use. Saviour, Lord, Redeemer, Deliverer, Heaven Sent. They don't say Son of God. But isn't that Amazing. Jesus draws out this response from thousands of people. Saviour, Lord, Redeemer, Deliverer. And they were genuine, would you believe? They were genuine. They were intense. They were really keen to have their heart's agenda, their heart need met. And they were looking at the right person, but with the wrong agenda. What they were seeing and declaring was accurate to this point, but it had the limitation of their own expectations. They need to stay focused and see what Jesus does. We would need to do the same as well. Because I have to say there's a fair possibility that we, our hearts, responses have been drawn as well. But there is an incompleteness. There's a sense in which my agenda, my expectations, are sitting higher on the rank than actually preparedness to see what Jesus was going to do and what he has done. 
That's one of the challenges. Every time we come to the Lord's Supper, for example, am I seeing in this action what Jesus has done? Or am I seeing in this some sort of reflection of my own expectations about Christian community, about the church that I'm a part of? Am I prepared to have my comprehension of the love of God constantly uh, stretched, growing, deepening, so that then I would see, yes, I would see the humility of Jesus. And every song that I give declaration to, every cry that I make will have integrity in it because it's based on the clear revelation and the, and the comprehension that the Spirit of God is giving to me. I started this morning sharing with you that uh, Jesus had clear the path that was set before him. He knew exactly what he had to do in the eternal plan of salvation. He was out to impact, draw out the heart responses of individuals, communities, a nation, people gathered in Christian communities called churches, He was out to reach every, every personal identity that walks the face of the earth. You stretched by that? I'm stretched by that. I didn't like it when Anthony read again. Please don't read again John 3.16 because it doesn't mention my name personally. And for my agenda, it needs to have my name. And Jesus says, yes, I've died for you, Peter. I've made every provision for your life to have its total fullness and meaning and purpose. But Peter, understand, I've got a world of people. I want to draw their heart response as well. Salvation belongs to our God. Salvation is a work that Jesus has completed in providing the point of access for us to experience his saving work. And it's an awesome thing. We pray together. And to assist the cause, I've taken one of the simplest prayers that we can offer. Please stand with me. And on the screen you'll see a version of the Lord's Prayer. And as we conclude that, we'll pause for a moment. You can start to consider some of the things that have been stirred within you this morning. And then Amanda will lead us in a song that has that word again, Hosanna. Perhaps a different comprehension, a different understanding of what it means. We pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, Pat.